So in our journey into how fast vehicles travel, we've gone from the ground, where no vehicles travel at speeds we call hypersonic, to the air, where we found some vehicles that do travel at hypersonic speeds. Now we move higher in altitude, into space. It won't be objects travelling in space that will be our interest here, but instead we'll be interested in vehicles travelling to and from space. As they pass through the atmosphere, they may travel at hypersonic speeds. When we talk about space, we're thinking of things outside of the Earth's atmosphere. So how far does the atmosphere extend above the Earth's surface? The first thing to note is that the Earth's atmosphere does not end abruptly, but just gets thinner and thinner as we go higher. This photograph, that was taken by an astronaut on the International Space Station, shows some of the features of the atmosphere made visible during a sunset. Scientists identified different regions of the atmosphere pretty much based on how the temperature varies with height. Remember how we looked at how the temperature of the air varies with altitude when we started to look at how fast vehicles travelled compared with the speed of sound? We said that the temperature of the air was important in determining the speed of sound, and the temperature decreases, then increases, and decreases again as we go to higher altitudes. Well, this helps us to identify regions of the atmosphere. The lowest region, up to the height at which typical passenger aircraft fly, around 12 kilometres, is called the troposphere. This is where around 80% of the mass of the air in the atmosphere is located. The next is the stratosphere. It extends up to about 50 kilometres altitude and is a region marked by increasing air temperatures. The mesosphere, where the air temperature drops again, then extends up to about 80 kilometres altitude. Then there is very little air. The end of the atmosphere and the edge of space are usually taken to be at an altitude of 100 kilometres above sea level. So let's have a look at what sorts of speeds spacecraft travel when they're passing through the atmosphere. Let's define a spacecraft as a man-made object that is designed to travel beyond the Earth's atmosphere. To get into space, and more so to return a vehicle from space, a vehicle usually travels through the atmosphere at hypersonic speeds. The first man in space was the Soviet astronaut Yuri Gagarin. He made one complete orbit of the Earth in April 1961. We'll look at his flight in a moment. The first American in space was Alan Shepard. His flight was suborbital, which means that his spacecraft was not propelled fast enough to enter into an orbit around the Earth. Instead, he was boosted by a redstone rocket on a ballistic trajectory. This diagram shows the flight trajectory. In May 1961, Shepard's Freedom 7 spacecraft was boosted to an altitude of 190 kilometres and splashed down in the ocean around 500 kilometres from the launch site at Cape Canaveral. Freedom 7 re-entered the atmosphere at a top speed of just over 8,300 kilometres per hour. This photograph shows the recovery of Alan Shepard and the Freedom 7 capsule after the splashdown. So that the maximum Mark number during the re-entry was around Mark 8. Another important suborbital flight was the 2002 High Shot launch by the University of Queensland. We launched a scramjet combustor on a two-stage rocket from Woomera in the Australian desert. This would be the first reported demonstration of supersonic combustion in flight. The payload was boosted to over 300 kilometres altitude on a ballistic trajectory. When the model re-entered, it reached a maximum speed of around 8,300 kilometres per hour. Again, around Mark 8. Data indicated that supersonic combustion had been achieved during that flight. The first privately funded manned spacecraft was Spaceship One in 2004. This photograph shows Spaceship One gliding back towards the Earth. This was also a suborbital flight. 
The spacecraft was carried by the White Knight mothership to an altitude of around 13 kilometres. Spaceship One was then released and it used hybrid rocket motors to propel it to a maximum altitude of just over 100 kilometres, that is, into space. Spaceship One claimed the X Prize by launching into space and returning twice within a two week period. On its second flight, the spacecraft reached an altitude of 112 kilometres and a maximum speed of around 3,500 kilometres per hour during its re entry. Therefore, its maximum Mark number was just over three on this flight. So, not hypersonic, but an important milestone in spaceflight. The successor, Spaceship Two, is undergoing testing to become the first commercial vehicle for space tourism. It's designed to reach a maximum altitude of 110 kilometres and a maximum speed of around 4,000 kilometres per hour. So let's move on to orbital speeds. In order for a spacecraft to enter orbit around the Earth, it must be boosted to a high altitude, higher than the edge of the Earth's atmosphere. But it does not just need to get to that altitude. In order to enter, say, a circular orbit, a spacecraft also has to have a high component of velocity parallel to the Earth's surface. The speed required is such that the centripetal acceleration it has, because it's travelling along a circular path, is exactly balanced by the acceleration due to gravity. And that's what gives weightlessness. For a spacecraft at an altitude just outside of the Earth's atmosphere, this is around 8,000 metres per second, or about 29,000 kilometres per hour. As I mentioned a couple of moments ago, the first manned orbit was made by Yuri Gagarin. He completed one orbit of the Earth in the Vostok 1 capsule. In order to return to Earth, his capsule speed had to be reduced. This was done by firing retro rockets to bring the spacecraft onto a re-entry trajectory. So when Gagarin re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, Vostok 1 would have been travelling at around 28,000 kilometres per hour. That's around Mark 25. The exact Mark number depends on what altitude you look at, because as we have seen, the temperature varies through the atmosphere, and therefore so does the speed of sound. So orbital re-entry is certainly hypersonic. All spacecraft that re-enter the Earth's atmosphere from low Earth orbit will come in at that sort of speed. The International Space Station is in low Earth orbit so any craft returning from the space station will come in through the atmosphere at around Mark 25. An example is the Space Shuttle. When the shuttle re-entered, it would come in at around that 28,000 km per hour mark, so around Mark 25 level. When it was travelling at hypersonic speeds, it was not flying like a conventional aircraft, but was at a very high angle of attack, much like in this photograph, of a space shuttle model in the T4 shock tunnel at UQ. The idea was to generate as much aerodynamic drag as possible and dissipate the kinetic energy of the shuttle into heating the air through which the shuttle was flying and in so doing slow it down so that it could land. This is a photograph of the final return from space of the space shuttle Atlantis. It was taken in 2011 by an astronaut on board the International Space Station. It shows the luminous plume generated by the shuttle hitting the air as it re-entered. It was only when the shuttle had slowed enough that it would fly more like an aeroplane and glide to a landing. This brings out an interesting point about flight at hypersonic speeds. Almost every hypersonic vehicle to date has been designed to spend as little time as possible flying at hypersonic speeds. When a rocket launches a satellite, the rocket usually gains most of its speed outside of the atmosphere. So a rocket might launch its payload to the edge of space in only a few minutes and pass through a maximum Mach number in the atmosphere of less than about 10. As we've seen, 
On re-entry, a spacecraft will experience much higher Mach numbers, we said around Mach 25, but it will be trying to slow down as quickly as possible. The idea is to limit the time the spacecraft is experiencing hypersonic heating conditions. Bear this in mind when we start looking at scramjet powered vehicles, where our aim is to spend time flying hypersonically so that we can accelerate and gain speed. We'll continue our journey into spacecraft that travel at speeds in excess of our Earth orbital speed in our next video. There we'll also look at a couple of spacecraft that have entered the atmosphere of celestial bodies other than the Earth.